John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Without such a costly sacrifice on the altar of freedom, we would not be here today worshiping as freely as we do. Thank the Lord for that this morning. First John chapter 2. As you're turning there, and before I launch in the sermon, I have to tell you a little bit about an experience I had last Sunday. Last Sunday, of course, was Mission Sunday, and Brad Gill was preaching, so that I kind of had the day off in a way. And I knew there was a lot of stuff that needed to be prepared in children's ministry. So I went to Cheryl Martin, and I told Cheryl, I said, you know, I'm not preaching on Sunday, so I have a little extra time, and I'd be happy to help any way I can. If you need me, just let me know. And she thanked me, and I didn't hear anything from her for about two or three days. And then I got an email that said that they were going to be short-staffed in the nursery <laughs> during second hour, and she wanted to take me up on my offer to help out. 
So what am I going to say to that? I mean, I was thinking like I could help Monday through Friday kind of a thing, but I said yes. And here I go. So second service last week, I did the opening part of the service, then I went downstairs and I reported for duty in the nursery. I was met by Helen Day, and Helen, she, she is Miss Nursery. She just loves that nursery, loves those babies, and I showed up, and Helen's the sweetest lady. I, you know, I love her. I know she loves me. But I don't think, Helen, I don't think you said hi or anything. You just looked at me and you said, go wash your hands. <laughs> so, so I did it. I went and washed my hands. I showed them to her. And, and she said, she said, uh, now, if you blow your nose, you go back and you wash your hands again. Or if you change a diaper, you go and wash your hands. And when she said change a diaper, I did like this silent scream just kind of came over me. <laughs> I hadn't thought about things like you know, diapers. And then Helen went on to say, but I'll be the one changing the diapers this morning. I had never wanted to hug and kiss a human being more <laughs> in my life. Nicest words I think I ever heard in my life. So I sat down on the floor and just settled in and tried to play with the kids. And kids were looking at me like, you know, who are you and why are you here? And they can't talk yet. So, you know, it was kind of awkward. And I tried to make them laugh, but I'm telling you, it's a tough room. I just couldn't get a <laughs> laugh out of these little guys. But eventually I won them over. Eventually, I went over when Helen handed me a box of cookies and told me I could be the snack guy for the day. <laughs> and I tell you, uh, I was the most popular guy in the world at, when I had those cookies, handed them out. It was fun. Uh, the highlight of the morning for me, though, was toward the end, there was a little boy in there, his name's Cody, just a cute little guy. And he'd been doing great, but toward the end, he started getting fussy, he started to kind of cry a little bit, and he's able to walk around a little bit. So I put my arms out, so opened my arms, and he walked right over to me, fell into my arms, and I sat there, and I just held him and kind of rocked him a little bit, and the little guy fell asleep in my arms, and that was just awesome. Now, I want you to know that I love you guys, but if it weren't for this preaching thing, I'd be down in the nursery <laughs> every week. I mean, it was fun. It was just so much joy down there. We had 15 babies in the nursery, second hour. And Cheryl said that there were another 18 in the preschool class, so we need help. And I'm telling you, from firsthand experience, that's a great place to be. So if God's leading you that, then go for it. But wash your hands first. I think it's very important. <laughs> well, today we return to our study in the letters of John, and we're calling, calling this series Love Letters because that's what John is talking to us about. John is very concerned about love, and he's calling us to live a life of love, to love God and love one another as, as God loves us, every day, everywhere, everyone. And I want to get right to it this morning. So as we look at John chapter 2, I'll begin reading at verse 7. John said this, Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness he does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. There's a brief outline in your worship folder. You can follow along this morning. I love how John says that what he's writing is not new. Uh, but then he says, well, but it is new. So <laughs> it's old and new. It, of course, came from Jesus. Uh, in John's day, people, a lot of people, a lot of religious people, uh, were trying to have some kind of rule and reign over people. A uh, group called the Pharisees, the ones I'm thinking of, and, and they had taken the law of Moses and they had added to it and further refined these different commands. And, and they came up with, over time, they came up with 365 prohibitions, and 250 commands, uh, 
people were to follow, if they wanted to be right with God, if you wanted God's favor in your life, you needed to follow all of these commands. These Pharisees, they claim to be experts in interpreting the law. And they represented everything bad about religion. You remember how many commandments God gave Moses on the mountain? Ten, right? Ten commandments. But that wasn't enough for these guys, for the Pharisees. They they wanted more. And so they came up with this 365 plus 250, which adds up to 615 rules and regulations. Now, people had to know and then, and then follow. This is what you had to do if you wanted God to be happy with you. I remember once taking a group of children to a junior camp, and, you know, it was fourth and fifth graders, and the first day of camp, we all had to gather, and there were several churches that had come together, and the camp director got up, and he said he wanted to go over the camp rules with the kids. So he started reading these rules. And, you know, rule one, two, three, they just, these were good, necessary camp rules. But I kid you not, I, I think he read at least 15 rules. Now, after like rule three or four, these rules were no longer, you know, really rules. They were more like suggestions and ideas for the kids. I mean, they were rules against things these kids had never even thought about. God gave us 10 rules. But suddenly, these 10 rules, in the hands of man, turned into 615. But what did Jesus do? He took us back. He didn't even take us back to 10. He took us back to one. (laughs) One command. That's all. And what was that one command? In, In John 15, Jesus said, My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. I mean, just looking at that (laughs) makes me say, thank you, Jesus. There's one command. Love each other as I have loved you. We're to love God. We're to love one another as God loves us. We don't have to memorize 615 prohibitions and commands. All we have to remember is one. All we have to do is love as Jesus loved us. You love as Jesus loved you. I love as Jesus loved me. We think, well, you know, is that, that's not really going to work, is it? I mean, we need a little more than that. And, and does that one command, does that somehow then kind of do away with the Ten Commandments? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, think about the Ten Commandments. Are, are you going to murder your brother if you love him? Are you going to lie to your brother if you love him? Are you going to cheat and steal from your sister if you love her? Are you going to covet your neighbor's wife, if you love your neighbor? Love, love, love. And love is wonderful and love is sweet. But love is also what holds us together. If our standard, if our goal is to love, and we do love, then somehow these commandments, they just, they just fall into place. Now, there are people we love, but on the other hand, there are also people that we don't love, people that are hard to love. John's going to go so far as to say there are people in our lives that we can be tempted to hate. I want to reread what John says in verses 9 through 11. He said, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. I like that first part of the passage, all the discussion about love. But now he brings hate into it. He brings hate into it. Let's talk a little bit about the hazards of hate. I thought it'd be good just to define hate. Webster's Dictionary defines hate as intense hostility and aversion, usually deriving from fear, anger, or sense of injury. And I just let you know, of course, you know, hate isn't always a bad thing. There are some things that we should hate. God tells us to hate certain things. For example, we should hate sin, and we should hate evil. 
But hate has no place in our relationships with, with one another. Now, I have to tell you, as I was preparing this message, I, I was searching my heart, and I, I was happy to find that I don't hate anybody. <laughs> uh, I was relieved at that. I, I don't have hatred toward anyone. At least I thought I didn't. Yesterday, I spent some time with a friend, and this is someone I love and I admire, uh, someone I don't see very often. And as he was talking to me, he said something that just that triggered some negative emotion within me. And I don't know exactly what it was. It wasn't what he was saying, but it could have been the words he used or it could have been the inflection of his voice. Uh, but as he was talking, there was something about him that reminded me of a, a man I used to know. And it's, it's a man who, who hurt me. And as he hurt me, it ended up hurting my family. And I remember I confronted him on it. And long and short of it is he just didn't care. He didn't care. So maybe there is something in me that my friend triggered yesterday. I don't know if it's hate. I hope it's not. i got to search myself on that. This just happened yesterday, so I need a little time to work it through. But it's obviously something that I need to deal with. Hatred, these negative feelings can creep in, and they can surprise us. Well, I don't want to dwell on hate or hatred today. Instead, I'd like to talk about some simple ways that we can deal with hatred. And the first thing is to be honest to God. To be honest to God about our, our hatred, about our anger even. Now, of course, this means we have to be honest with ourselves, too. We have to tell the truth about how we really feel. But then we need to take that and tell God about it. Before confession, before asking for forgiveness even, I mean, why not, why not simply tell God the story? You know, tell him how you'd been hurt. Tell him about the feelings that that has left. Tell him about the hatred that you're dealing with. Tell God the truth. You know, he knows it anyway. He's well aware of your emotions. I want to share with you a, a great quote from Eugene Peterson. He said, It is easy to be honest before God with our hallelujahs. It is somewhat more difficult to be honest before God in the dark emotions of our hate. So we commonly suppress our negative emotions, unless neurotically we advertise them. Or when we do express them, we do it far from the presence or what we think is the presence of God, ashamed or embarrassed to be seen in these curse-stained overalls. But when we pray the Psalms, the classic prayers of God's people, we find that that will not do. We must pray who we actually are, not who we think we should be. The way of prayer is not to cover up our unlovely emotions so that they will appear respectable, but to expose them so that they can be enlisted in the kingdom of God. I love that sentence. We must pray who we actually are, not who we think we should be. I got an iPad recently, and I have this little devotional that I try to read every day, and then I have a little uh, document that comes up that I can write down my reflections on it and, and include a prayer uh, with it. I type it all out. It's really helpful for me. And I, I did it the other day, and I was sitting outside, and I'm typing up this prayer to God, and I kept going back and changing the words, you know, trying to make it better and better, make sure the punctuation was okay, and... You know, like, like, like I was taking this prayer and, and turning it in as a school report or something that God is going to grade. I was more concerned with the mechanics of what I was saying than actual, the actual content of the prayer. Prayer is honest conversation with God. Express anger. Express hatred. Tell him the story. God can handle it. And then we do something else. Not just, not just tell God the truth. Not just you know, be honest to God. 
But then we need to hand our hate over to God. Don't just talk to God about your negative emotions. Hand them to him. Pass them along to him. God's not afraid of our emotions. He's not afraid of anger. He's not afraid of hate. He can handle our desire for retaliation and revenge. Uh, Stuffing it doesn't make it go away. Rather, stuffing makes us captive to it. To be honest to God and then say, God, I need your help. I, I, I need your help in this. We Last weekend, Sue and I hosted Dave and Debbie Bliss in, in our home. They're our missionaries to South Africa. And if you know Dave Bliss, you'll agree. The, the man is a talker. <laughs> the man can talk. It's, it's really, I've never met anybody like him. Uh, he can talk and talk and talk. But, you know, it's not all about him. It, it's like it somehow he draws you in, and it's captivating, interesting. You know, he makes you feel loved and affirmed. And we had dinner Saturday night. We sat down at the table. And I started uh, the meal after the prayer. I started by asking Dave a question, one question. I asked him, said, Dave, how many prisons are you involved in? That's his ministry. He's involved in prison ministry, discipleship among prisoners. So I asked him, are you involved in one prison or, or several prisons? He could have answered that question in like two seconds, right? He didn't. Um, he started by talking about apartheid and went into this. Uh, I'm guessing that about 30 minutes later, Debbie, his wife, she sweetly interrupted him for this, this brief moment to say, Dan, he's ministering in 11 prisons. <laughs> <laughs> so he could have given me the short answer. Now, we all laughed at that. Dave laughed the loudest. Uh, could have given me a short answer, 11 prisons. But, you know, if he had given me that short answer, I would have missed a great story, a great story he told. And I'm going to get this story a little bit wrong. I didn't take notes as he was talking. So if you see Dave, ask him about it. He'll give you more detail. But he told a story about a certain prisoner, a South African prisoner, that David helped disciple. And this man was involved in some really bad stuff. That's what landed him in prison. And, and Dave spent quite a bit of time with him, uh, over a considerable length of time, and it appeared from all accounts that this prisoner's life had been tra- changed and transformed by the grace of God. So after the prisoner served his sentence, Dave I- invited him to take part in some different ministries that Dave was doing. Uh, Dave put his trust in this man and gave him some responsibilities and things. And before long, this prisoner betrayed Dave's trust and did some really horrible things, things that, that hurt Dave and hurt others. And just long and short of it is this man betrayed Dave and betrayed, betrayed his trust. Uh, before long, the man was uh, arrested again, put back in prison, and Dave went into prison one day. He was doing his ministry and walked into this room, and boom, here face-to-face he is now with this guy, this man who had betrayed him. And so the prisoner came up to Dave and, uh, and apologized. He said he was, he was wrong. He told him he was sorry. He asked Dave to forgive him. And then this, uh, just I love Dave's response. Dave told him that, that he couldn't forgive him at that moment. He said, you know, I, I can't say I forgive you. I mean, I can say the words... But if I say the words and don't mean it in my heart, he said, I'd be lying to you, and I'd be lying to God. So I can't tell you today that I forgive you, but I can tell you that I'm going to take this to God. I'm going to talk to God about this and see what God wants me to do. Did I get that story pretty much right, Sue? Okay, good. Um, So then more time passed. I don't remember how much. It might have have been a year. I don't know what Dave said, but about a year later or so. Dave hadn't seen this guy. And a year later, he's doing a study. And in this study is this guy, this prisoner. And they do the study. And after the study, this guy walks right up to Dave. And he simply asks Dave, he said, well? (laughs) And Dave said, well, what? And the man said, "What, what did God tell you? Did God tell you to forgive me? And then Dave said, forgive you for what? 
Dave had completely forgotten uh, about the injury that this man had, had caused. It just was like gone from his memory. The man went on to tell Dave how he had sinned against him, and, and then Dave knew that he could tell him sincerely and honestly, I forgive you. I forgive you. Isn't that amazing? He'd already forgotten it. Usually, you know, we forgive them, try to forget. He forgot. And then he forgave. Dave told that story. I loved it. And I told him, I said, you know, Dave, that story had a much different ending than I thought it was going to have. I thought God was going to convict you and, you know, uh, uh, just give you this, you know, burden that you have to go to this man and, and you know, extend forgiveness. And, and isn't God good? Instead of judging Dave or uh, dealing with Dave in any kind of negative way, God, some way, somehow, just allowed Dave to just forget it. Allowed Dave to forget it, which opened him up then to forgive. I love how Dave handed that situation to God. He had to be honest, and he was honest to God. He asked for God's help, and God gave it to him in a surprising way. God can handle our hate. God is here to help us. We just have to ask him. Uh, finally, we need to choose love over hatred. Verse 10, whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. Bible scholars are a little confused with this verse. Uh, it says, whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. That's the part that gets a little confusing, because it can mean that if you continue to hate, then you're going to stumble. But grammatically, it could also mean that when we continue to hate, we cause others to stumble. When there's hatred in the church, it causes the community to stumble. When they see that, that contradiction between Christ and our behavior and our attitudes, it can cause them to stumble. But either way, it's good. This call to love comes from Jesus. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. We're to love as Jesus loves us every day, everywhere, everyone. I, I do want to say, however, that choosing love over hate, it isn't always easy, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we let someone who has hurt us or injured us, it doesn't necessarily mean we let them back into our lives. It's interesting, here in 1 John, John tells us that we're to love one another, but we'll find in 2 John, John has, uh, you know, a, kind of a, 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 another view when it comes to certain people. Uh, John, in 2 John, he warns the church about false teachers. He warns the church about those who abuse the word of God. And as a result, John tells them in verse 10 and verse 11, he says, Do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. So here in 1 John, it's love, love, love. In 2 John, it's shut the door and turn the deadbolt. We need wisdom. When do we do that? When do we exclude someone from our heart or from our lives? What boundaries, what limits do we set? We need God's help in determining that. I want to read you another quote. This is from Daryl Johnson, wonderful pastor, preacher. He said this. I, I love this. Jesus did not say, like your enemies. Jesus did not say, feel good feelings about your enemies. He said to love them, which is a very different matter. Love is an act of the will. Love is a decision. Choose as an act of the will to will the welfare of your enemy. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Jesus frees us to express and then re-release our pent-up anger and hate. It is then that the Holy Spirit comes and floods our souls with the love that dies on the cross for enemies. God's love is the love that died on the cross for enemies. 
Before we come to the communion table, I want to tell you one last story. On Christmas Eve, 1914, during World War I, the sounds of rifles firing and shells exploding suddenly came to a stop. It, it was quiet. At first light on the dawn of Christmas Day, some German soldiers emerged from their trenches and approached the Allied lines across what was called like a no-man's land. They were calling out, Merry Christmas, in their enemies' native languages. At first, the Allied soldiers feared it was a trick, that they were going to get ambushed or something, or, or hurt, and harmed. Uh, but then they noticed that the German soldiers were unarmed. And so they began to climb out of their trenches and shake hands with these enemy soldiers. And the men exchanged presents of cigarettes and plum puddings. What a combination, huh? Cigarettes and plum puddings. And sang carols, hymns, and songs. So there was even a documented case of soldiers from opposing sides playing a good-natured game of soccer. There were no, they were no longer British or German to each other. During that brief time, they were simply fellow men. The picture you're looking at is a picture of a cross left in Belgium in 1999, and it commemorates the site of the Christmas truce in 1914. The text on the cross reads, 1914, the khaki chums Christmas truce to 1999, 85 years, lest we forget. We have two powerful symbols before us this morning. We have the cross of Jesus Christ, and we have the communion table. And the cross, it calls us to a ceasefire with God, with one another. Is there someone you feel hatred toward? If so, tell God the story. Ask for his help. And the table calls for a truce. We can't come to the table with our weapons locked and loaded. The table calls us to a truce, and not for a day or two, a once and for all truce. We're to lay our weapons down. We're to walk away from those weapons and walk toward one another. We're to love one another as Jesus loves us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us live as you lived. Help us love as you loved. We were once your enemies. Our sin caused you to turn us away, or it caused you to turn us, yes, away from us. But your grace and your generous sacrifice has made us your friends. Help us with our anger and hatred. Heal us and fill us with a love that can only come from you. Amen.